Thank you, Kevin. So welcome to the second invited talk. I'm very happy to introduce uh, Christian Reschberger for this invited talk. Christian is a professor at TU Grass. Uh, he's a very important member of the FSC community. He has done many work in the field and he was uh, chair of FSC 2014. So Christian did his PhD on hash functions after the work of uh, Xiao Yun Wang et al on Xiao Wan and related hash functions. And um, he did a lot of work in the field and I was also doing my PhD at the time. So we had many occasions to interact and I read a lot of his papers. And it was a very interesting time for uh, hash function cryptanalysis and design. And in particular, one paper that uh, stood out from uh, Christian and Christophe de Carnier was uh, this paper where they give a, a way to build an automatic tool to find differential traits from sha And I think this was a very influential uh, paper in symmetric cryptography because before that, a lot of the differential attack were found by hand. And at that time we started having tools to do that. And this, has, uh, this still had a, a lasting impact even today in this FSC, we had lots of papers about automatic tools to find those attacks. And I think this all goes back to this uh, very important paper. So there was a lot of work on Shawan at the time. Unfortunately, nobody managed to find the collision in those days. It took almost another 10 years before uh, the collision was found. But uh, all this work was really based on uh, this tool uh, from uh, Christian and Christoph. So more generally, Christian did a lot of work in uh, cryptanalysis. Uh, in particular, I think three important uh, techniques that he proposed were the, the rebound attack, the big click attack, and more recently, the multiple of eight property on VAS. And I think you've probably all heard about uh, those tools and they have been or will be used in many different contexts. Uh, Christian also did a lot of work on primitive design, and this will be, uh, I think, the topic of his invited talk. In particular, he's a designer of uh, Grostel, who was a Shafri finalist of Prince, of Haraka, LoMC, MIMC, Rasta, Pussy Island, and I'm probably missing a few. Uh, the, more recently, those designs have been oriented towards specific applications like fully homomorphic encryption, MPC, zero knowledge, and I guess this will, uh, Christian will explain all of this. And I think one important also uh, line of work in this area is uh, that he's a co-designer of two signature schemes in the NIST post-quantum competition. So this is a case where symmetric cryptography is used for public key cryptography. And I think that's uh, a very interesting line of work. And to conclude, I would just like to point out that, uh, well, all this work has been very influential for the symmetric community. We're now uh, a, a a big amount of our work is now geared towards a specific application with lots of new design, new cryptanalysis. And in fact, all of this is now leading us back to hash function design and cryptanalysis for uh, Stark and Snark and things like this. And this is kind of going around from uh, the time of the Shafri competition. I think that's a, quite a nice evolution uh, for the field. So uh, I will leave the floor to uh, Christian. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gaetan, for the very nice introduction. Brings back a lot of memories of the exciting time 10, 15 years ago. And uh, I think we, we are again having a very exciting time. And uh, so, yeah, thanks a lot also to FSE for having me here. Um, I'm very glad to, to give this talk. And um, let me switch over to my slides. OK, thanks for your help. <laughs> uh, share screen. Okay, I guess you can see my slides now on the internet. Yeah, let me start out with a, a bit of a longer arc. Um, Semantic crypto is around for a long time. Uh, public research in Semantic crypto since the 1970s, perhaps. And in the early days, we, well, use cases were always around confidentiality, authenticity, integrity related topics and in the early days the focus was a lot on um, hardware implementations being efficient in hardware until the 80s for sure. Uh, a very nice example is the uh, block cipher that became a standard we refer to it now as the DES. I mean it was back then essentially a lightweight hardware design. Uh, the S-boxes were designed such that they would fit at least one S-box on one chip at a time to these were the implementation constraints. Uh, before that already, we had a, a number of LFSR-based approaches that have been used perhaps even for, for decades. This changed uh, a bit, uh, the latest in the 90s with more and more software implementations becoming 
relevant in addition to hardware. This also was, the, was at the time when uh, a new encryption standard was highly overdue. And I guess the selection that was made then reflects this change where in addition to hardware implementation properties, also software implementation properties became quite, quite important. And uh, more recently, if anything else, this uh, importance of software environments became more boost, if you want, also due to virtualizations. In this conference, we, we had another example from uh, use cases in the telecom sector, but there it was uh, for a long time, uh, one of the longstanding hardware interested uh, corners of our design spaces, if you want, but also there due to virtualization, software implementation properties become more and more uh, relevant. Yeah, I, I tried to illustrate the role of Smarty Crypto of our community in, in a larger context of uh, systems. So I guess it's fair to say that um, Smarty Crypto primitives, and I include cryptographic caching here, um, plays a fundamental role and, uh, and other layers that are needed in our security ecosystem build up on it. Classically, um, we have hybrid uh, encryption in order to uh, simplify key management, PKI, and so on. And on top of that, we have uh, just systems and users. So that's something that we we, we have already for, for a long time. Yet. And uh, the purpose of my talk here is to, to give you a bit of an overview of new applications of semantic cryptography that have developed and that are developing in the last uh, five plus years. And in particular, I, I will focus on three different um, um, new cryptographic functionalities, let's say, that in turn give rise to new use cases of crypto and also new demands for semantic crypto. And um, one of them is in the area of homomorphic encryption. I'm singling out one use case there, a very generic one, namely the, the problem and the task of reducing the almost inherent ciphertext expansion we have in these schemes. Then uh, the area of secure multi-party computation is something that started out as a theory in the 80s, but in the last 10 years, becoming more and more practical with uh, commercializations uh, happening a lot in the last years. There are many use cases for, for PRFs, for the crypto in there. Um, I will single out for the purpose of my talk here, a, a very special uh, use case, namely uh, a way to use MPC uh, in the head, so to say, uh, in a non-interactive setting, which it can then also use to create uh, signature schemes. And uh, as we are now also, our community is hunting for um, replacements for, for currently used uh, key encapsulation signature schemes, also against the power of future potentially stable quantum computers. This is then a candidate for such um, uh, yeah for such a project. And the last but not least, in the area of zero knowledge proofs, especially hash functions are uh, needed there. For example, if you want to prove membership uh, membership in a set, it always boils down to proving knowledge of a pre-image of a hash function. And there, the implementation properties of those hash functions relative to these proof systems are becoming uh, yeah, very important. So going back to, to my pyramids, we have now a different layer, if you want, of, of of, of protocols of, of, of libraries that will have to use also for efficiency reasons, semantic crypto again, but this semantic crypto layer, this foundation again, uh, better be different because um, otherwise our efficiency, the goal of semantic crypto is often to, to uh, enable applications by providing practical efficiency is otherwise not met. And that's why I have these question marks here. And, um, what uh, what's happened in the last years is that we are trying to fill in these question marks. And uh, I hope uh, at the end of the talk, I have given you an idea of the current state of uh, what's, what, what's going on there. Uh, and in order to prepare ourselves and equip ourselves with a mental model as to how we should think of, of this new layer, um, I'm go again going, going back to, to the 80s where we've seen this transition from a lot of interest in hardware implementations to an interest also, also in, in, in software implementations. This doesn't mean that hardware went away, not at all, it also grew, 
but software grow arguably uh, much more. And um, in some sense, the way I see it is that we are also now in a, such a tr transition again, that of course hard, hard and software direct implementations will not go away, but there's this emergence of indirect implementations, that, that's how I call it, within protocols for this high function cryptography, be it multiparty computations, you know, it proofs or related, related high level protocols. And um, so maybe for us, uh, a way to think about this is in terms of virtual machine or, or in terms of um, yeah, layers again. So whereas in the 80s, we had our hardware layer and then we built our semantic crypto on top. Uh, starting from the 90s, we had uh, the software layer on top of the hardware layer and then we built our semantic crypto on top. And if you want, now we have another virtual machine layer on top of this software and hardware layer that gives us, exposes us some, some operations that are efficient, some others that are not so efficient. And now our goal is to basically program this virtual machine with efficient semantic crypto. So I hope this, this mental model helps a bit to, to, to follow me throughout, throughout this talk here. Okay, so this is um, the outline of my talk. So we've been through the high level motivations and I will now move through three example applications, uh, basically telling a story as to how the development went, where we are at the moment. The thing is, I guess we are early in this transition or in the middle of this transition. So it's a bit hard to, to be um, clear. It will be easier in five years time with the benefit fit of the inside to see what's actually worked and, and what not. Uh, but I still hope uh, I, I can make this uh, as clear as possible. There will be open problems uh, along the way, but I will have a, a separate section at the end uh, with um, more thoughts on, on hardcore uh, crypto and uh, crypto analysis problems, if you want. But let me start out with one of the applications, and this is the one where I will spend more, more time on, the hybrid homomorphic encryption case. Most of it is, is quite generic. Uh, it's also based on a very recent work with uh, with my team um, that you can see here on the slide. So, but let me motivate this uh, with another trend that uh, we started seeing already 15 years ago, um, when people still talked about client and server architectures. Uh, other people started to talk about cloud computing. Uh, the difference may not be so big, but anyway, there's this this drive of um, due to economic incentives to outsource computation. An example, uh, machine learning uh, as a service, I have a, a number of pictures in my photo album and I don't want to classify them by hand or take them by hand. Uh, I would like to ask a, a cloud service to do this for me perhaps. A toy example is, um, is here on this slide. Um, one obvious problem is perhaps that I don't want to share all my uh, pictures of cats with uh, some, some, some outside service, but still I would like to use this, this tagging functionality. Um, this seems to be um, hard to, to address, but then homomorphic encryption in principle uh, can help with that. Uh, without homomorphic encryption, uh, I as a client will send my data to some server. The server needs to read it in the clear and sends them the, the result back. Um, so far so good, but that's something that reveals our data here, even on the line. Um, but then most importantly, even if it's encrypted on the line, it will be, will have to be decrypted on the, on the server side. And now I mentioned to you before, um, theoretically, we know now since, um, since, uh, yeah, 12, 13 years, the homomorphic encryption principle, we can perform everything in, a, in an encrypted domain as well. So we can not only um, store encrypted data, but also compute on encrypted data without knowing the secret decryption key. And uh, by, by that, uh, yeah, allowing for more, yeah, allowing to support this outsourcing uh, uh, idea. There are a number of underlying homomorphic encryption schemes. I'm only listing a few here. They all work with uh, noise and they all depend on the number of uh, operations that you want to do in this encrypted domain. Very often for most of the schemes, not for all of them, but for most of them, the, the depth of the multiplication 
circuit that you want to perform drives a lot the, the overall size of the parameters in, in this scheme, which then also affects the cost of all these operations that you that you that you want and, and need to do. Um, so with homomorphic encryption, in principle, this situation can be addressed. Uh, your data can be with your private key on the client side can be encrypted, sent to the server. The server can compute on it without decrypting it and, and sending it back. So far so good, but uh, one of the practical example, uh, practical problems is the huge self expansion you, you have here. This can be between a factor 10 and a, and a factor a million, depending on the type of data that, that you're working with. So you have already this additional cost on the server side because the plane computations are much, much cheaper than these uh, homomorphic uh, computations. But you also put a lot of load on the connection between the, the two endpoints here. And perhaps also if the client is resource constrained, um, yeah, um, you need a lot of energy perhaps to, to send all this, all this data whereas without uh, this encryption, uh, this might be very, very efficient. So as a concrete example, for uh, a popular um, HG library, the smallest quantity that you can send is um, 7.4 megabytes. And uh, what you can encode in terms of plain text uh, may be very little, but up to 250 kilobytes. So the, the, the smallest possible cipher text expansion here is already a factor 30 or so. Um, and uh, if you would, however, um, encrypt the message that you have, the text that you have, uh, or the, the image that you have, or whatever, with a semantic encryption scheme before, send that as a, as a ciphertext to the server, and then only homomorphically encrypt the key for this semantic encryption scheme, then essentially you have addressed the ciphertext uh, expansion. So that's the, that's the theory, right? Uh, here, my illustration for that. The, the point, the, the problem is, even though, I mean, first of all, if I only send a very small amount of data, then this doesn't help much because the key needs to go for this cipher expansion anyhow. But very soon, this um, encryption of the secret key of this um, uh, semantic encryption scheme will amortize. And then, indeed, the cipher expansion is largely addressed. Um, the problem is now I have to decrypt this uh, before I can even do my my my, my payload uh, computation on this on this message on this on this input that I wanted to do, for example, image classification. Um, I still have to decrypt it before. So on top of the already heavy computations I have to do on the server side on the cloud, uh, I have to first decrypt. So this increases not only the number of operations but also the depth. And that's why this this puts a lot of um, this puts a lot of additional constraints on the cost of the yeah of the server set. So basically, this approach at the high level doesn't directly solve an issue without giving you drawbacks, but it basically gives you a trade-off. Where on one hand you increase the, the server computations even more, whereas at the same time you reduce data transmission, you re reduce efforts on the client side. Um, so we try to work this out uh, at, at a high level, and this is now doubly logarithmic uh, graph that, that, shows, that, that shows the effect on the client side with and without uh, this homomorphic, hybrid homomorphic encryption. So with, um, what this basically shows is that uh, for slow networks, um, the ciphertext expansion is prohibitive because the, the, the runtime just to to send or the, to to compute this uh, this uh, the, the stuff that needs to be done on the client side is just prohibitive. You have here uh, many orders of of making to in terms of seconds in, in runtime, um, and and this becomes better uh, with very high. Uh, speed networks. With hybrid homomorphic encryption, you still have this trade-off curve, but there are many orders of magnitude uh, are better. I mean, of course, it depends on, on many other things as well, but this is a high level, the, the, big, the big promise of this, of this approach. So to, 
to wrap up, uh, this is one use case for new semantic encryption schemes. The depth of this, the circuit, especially the depth of respect to multiplications, uh, will be important. And to classical semantic crypto descents, how does this translate to? Well, this translates to low rounds descent. So we want to we want to minimize the number of rounds, basically at at, at all costs. Um, what usually happens with um, constructions that only have a low number of rounds is that we are susceptible to types of attacks. And uh, one idea that I will outline in the next step will be to, to move away from, from static uh, fine layers towards fine layers that, that change all the time. Um, yeah. So I tried to compile uh, a list of the ideas that went into this field, and I will walk through it um, right now for you. So fairly soon after the first um, FHE schemes were implemented, people tried to, on top of that, uh, basically as a, as a use case, as, as a test case, implement a yes as well. So this happened in 2012, and this is basically the, ba the, the baseline for, for, for this kind of for this kind of research. What happened first was that uh, uh, we and others um, looked into concrete designs that uh, still otherwise resemble classical block ciphers or, or stream ciphers, but uh, minimize the number of ends and, and aim for low depth. That is the LMC design on one hand with the idea of partial as boxes, uh, Krivium on the other hand, uh, taking many ideas for, from, from the Trivium design and, and uh, improving it towards a higher security level. And it was showing uh, very good uh, properties with respect to uh, initially, initially showing good properties with respect to this use case. Uh, what happened then later uh, was that a new idea came into the field, namely to make relevant, cryptographically relevant computations independent um, of, the, of the secret key. That was first uh, done by a design called Flip, where uh, yeah, key register mixing was offloaded. Uh, in the raster design in 2018, what we did is to, to put more of this offloading, um, um, put more of the cryptographically relevant computations into this offloading, namely the, uh, yeah, otherwise very, otherwise you know, not useful, but because it's very expensive to generate these fine layers for our designs um, on the fly. So that, that happened in 2018. Um, for labs made, for example, with Duster made this offloading uh, cheaper. And uh, very recently, also, uh, colleagues in Korea started to have variants that not only work over the bit strings, but also over FP, otherwise looking a bit similar to Raster. So what happened more recently um, was to look more into the, st the structure of the underlying um, homomorphic encryption schemes. Um, our work here on PASTA also focusing on, on FP, but uh, exploiting more of the structure and hence uh, having uh, better, better, yeah, better implementation properties. Um, FASTA, another design by colleagues from the University of Bergen, um, started out with, with RASTA and, and uh, concretely optimized it for, for concrete um, um, homomorphic encryption schemes. Also very uh, exciting that something that is, that is also very new, um, a different uh, support of this idea for a different type of uh, homomorphic encryption scheme, namely CKKS, which is, is useful when you want to uh, support machine learning use cases because they are, you are naturally uh, dealing with uns uh, uncertainty and noise. And uh, you can work over the reels actually. And there, a new design from Asia Group last year called HERA was the first to, to, to show how this can work. And then this is uh, also a very interesting uh, line of work that I, that I like. So I will not go into any specific details of those designs here anymore. Uh, for the concrete case of pasta that, that, we, that we did, I have here a few, I have here a few takeaways. So this is basically for the um, type of HE scheme that is not uh, used for, for the machine learning use cases, but, but, but for other computations, uh, 
this seems to be the most promising at the moment where the bandwidth uh, reduction is something that we can report on with practical implementations of um, a reduction of uh, at least a factor 20, but this is actually the worst case in practice is, is much more. And then also on, on, on the client side, the encryption, you don't have to do this, the, the payloads, the big payload encryption with the homomorphic encryption scheme anymore, but we can do this with this semantic encryption scheme. It's, it's of course not as fast as the, our classical uh, schemes, but still much, much faster than the alternative view. So of the hundred we can report here. Um, yeah, on, on the server side, as I mentioned before, there's this trade-off. So we increase the, the computations on the server side. Um, in particular, we add more multiplications to whatever other payloads computations that you want to do. Um, yeah, in the integer case, so that's the new thing, in Buster, uh, you don't have to convert your, your circuit into, into a binary circuit anymore. You can stay with the integers. And there we, we add uh, four plus six uh, multiplications. The, the best competitor, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the best alternative for the binary case appears to be a cluster, even though the security margin is there, is there very slim, or is having a similar amount of additional computations to be done on the server side. Yeah, so the runtime overhead uh, um, is still quite substantial. The runtime um, for homomorphic encryption scheme computations on the server side is already pretty, pretty large, and it depends uh, on the use case how much larger it gets. And that's that's a topic that was so far a bit um, neglected in our in our community here. We we simply designed these these schemes and did not care about the use case. Uh, we started to to consider uh, concrete use cases, and we have a small one and 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 the and the large, and the large uh, use case. So the, the runtime overhead for large use cases is actually less than a factor ten. Um, for smaller use cases, uh, the, the the runtime overheads can be more than a factor thousand. So that means so the, the answer is basically um, it depends. But uh, the, the nice thing about homomorphic encryption, there's other, other application areas like this that every year you see um, ideas and improvements, not only on the semantic crypto sites, but also on the underlying crypto systems. So, so that's why this, yeah, the, um, if you want, um, it's a bit related to uh, Moore's law on the, on the hardware side where you can can expect uh, even with, with with your same solution basically you, you can expect better and cheaper implementations uh every year essentially um, yeah so with that um i would like to move on to my second example that's uh, a use case that Gadon mentioned already in his introduction namely um the idea to um construct public key signature schemes using semantic crypto and semantic crypto only, including uh, cryptographic hashing, of course. Um, again, this will highly be, uh, mostly be um, high level, but the, the most recent uh, results is something that will, is based on, on this paper here that uh, will appear at CCS uh, later this year. And uh, let me start out with this, um, story on the development of signature sizes over, over the years uh, in, this, in, this, in this domain. So the, the high level motivation is that, uh, okay, we want long-term security and uh, we are afraid that in the long run, uh, quantum computers may become large and stable enough to implement uh, attacks on our schemes nowadays. There are a number of, as you're all aware of, there are a number of uh, candidates around and NIST is looking for, uh, standards in this direction and there are uh, several promising candidates most of them introduce some kind of um, yeah, mathematical structure um, be it uh, in the area of codes be it in the area of lattices or be it in the area of um, of um, yeah for example oil and vinegar uh, approaches you might think this is inherent in public key crypto, and this is, seems to be true for um, public key encryption and key encapsulation, but for public key signatures, 
this is not necessary. It's it's known theoretically already for a long time that um, yeah, somatic crypto preoccupation caching can be can be enough. The, the the thing is, it was never deemed to be uh, at least not until uh, let's say 2015 it was never deemed to be um, practical enough to be a, a drop-in replacement for our currently used uh, signature schemes. The the well-known long-standing approach to to this is hash-based signatures. It goes back to the 1970s. Um, usually, always in, in, in a in a in a mode in, in a way which required you to keep a state, hence not allowing you to to use it as a drop-in replacement. But uh, with new optimizations uh, around um, things, and um, Andreas Hülsing is leading the effort there. Uh, people manage to have um, signature sizes uh, in the area of, of uh, only dozens of, of, of kilobytes while having such a large possibility uh, space such that you don't need to keep uh, a state anymore without jeopardizing uh, security otherwise. So this is basically the baseline and this is a, yeah, a fairly old idea that uh, got uh, much improved and um, and uh, optimized recently. This is the blue line here, the hash based signature line. And, and that was basically it. Uh, there was another approach uh, that was theoretically around for some time, but uh, again, something that people never considered to be of any practical use, but with um, some improvements in the area of general purpose um, proof systems for, for, for circuits, it suddenly made sense to have uh, a signature scheme based on an MPC in the head circuit where you compute all the, the players basically uh, by yourself and then reveal parts of them. Uh, and if you make this depending on, on, a, on a message, then this is something that can serve as a signature, uh, which contains the signature itself contains then those, those partially, partially uh, revealed internal states of, of your computation and, and allows then anyone to verify the signature. So that's where we were around 2016 or so. And uh, what you need in there is a relationship between a public key and a private key uh, via a one-way function. Um, instantiating such approaches with uh, one-way functions based on standards like uh, SHA-2, SHA-3, AES, uh, led to signature sizes in the megabytes. And, and, and it turned out that uh, LoMC that was around at the time already optimized, among others, for MPC use cases was a, a very suitable choice and, and the best uh, use case, uh, the, the best choice around the time, because the signature size depends a lot on the number of multiplications. And that's one of the metrics that LoMC allows allows to, to optimize for. So LoMC is a, it's a very parameterizable design where you, as a user, if you want, you can choose the block size, the number of S boxes per round, the, um, the allowable data complexity, the, the key size and so on. And then um, you get an instance and you can choose among a huge amount of instances and then choose one that uh, is, is suitable for a particular use case like that. And then with that, uh, when the NIST competition started, um, we found basically what we thought was the, the sweet spot, the, the best choice, and we arrived at a signature size. This is now a security level of 128 um, bits of, of uh, slightly more than 30, 30 kilobytes. Um, yeah, we thought we squeezed out everything we could, but what happened was that essentially every year new ideas came around, either on the proof system side and, and, and recently also again on the on the one-way functions side, such that now actually we for the first time have hash-based, uh, sorry, uh, MPC in the head-based uh, public key signature schemes with a signature size below five kilobytes. So this is already getting into um, an area where the largest lattice-based signatures are not so much smaller anymore. There's only factor two, factor two left. And, and again, of course, we. We think we squeezed out everything. We squeezed out everything. Now this is the best we can do. But looking back, uh, yeah, it looks like we have been wrong already um, a while. 
and it may well be that in the future we we can see more more improvements. Of course, this is now only the the signature size comparison. Uh, runtime is also something that is relevant, and, and those approaches, especially for signature creation, are not so fast. So they they need a few milliseconds on a on a commodity on commodity hardware. Um, this is okay for for many use cases, but perhaps not for the most uh, demanding ones. But that's what you get if you want to minimize your trust assumptions, right? Because with, with those two approaches, you only need, well, you need hashing for for signatures anyway, usually, and then you don't need any additional hardness assumption. No latest assumption, no uh, code assumption, nothing else. And that costs something, but uh, the cost is, is, is going down, as you can see. So with this uh, high level, Treatment. Let me now go a little bit into the very recent uh, design that we did, um, that got inspired by uh, protocols that allow uh, not only to deal with uh, multiplications in a more and more efficient way, but those uh, always still drove the number, uh, the well, the cost basically. But uh, different protocols that. Uh, can be made efficient as well, but also finite field inversion can be made very efficiently. And uh, I guess I don't have to explain to you the ASS box in too much detail. Uh, you have a finite field inversion in the case of a yes in a, in, in a smaller field, and then you have some affine layer added to it. And uh, now as a mental exercise, think of this AES, but ASS box and, and simply expand it to a full, to a full state. And you have, you have, a, you have a, a round function that operates on your full internal states, for example, 128 bits with a finite field inversion. And then you add some affine layer to this. So what we have now, um, something we call rain that looks exactly like that's what you have on the, on the slide here. And, and this is the whole design. Um, so we can only break two rounds. So this is already the free round version if you want. And we don't even have an attack on this one here. So we have three finite field inversions, two of those affine layers. Um, yeah, that's it basically. Or the no key schedule. So it's it's a very minimalistic design, and, and that's that allows for this very, uh, very, very low signature size as well. Um, so one, one thing to keep in mind is this is not a general purpose block cipher. We use this as a, as a one-way function where you, you're basically given the output, the cipher text if you want, and uh, or input, an input output pair and your task to uh, recover the key. So this rules out uh, many classes of attacks already by default, but uh, yeah, gives more focus on, on those attacks, algebraic attacks, for example, that can deal with Kick that can deal with this setting. Yeah, so if you have any ideas how, how to uh, attack this, this scheme, well, for our practical um, proposals, then we actually uh, propose four rounds because it doesn't cost too much more and um, gives us a bit of security margin. This is now a table uh, comparing RAIN or RAINIER, this is then our signature scheme based, based on RAIN with um, other candidates in the PQ. Uh, competition uh, picking against things I had already in the in, in the graph before yeah, having um, signature sizes between 30 and 10 or 16 and 8 um, kilobytes signing times in the in the in the milliseconds in the higher milliseconds sometimes and verification times in in, in, in the lower milliseconds and um, if you compare this to to other Candidates around so lithium, for example, a latest based signature scheme has a uh, has a signature size also of, of more than two kilobytes. And with our rain instances, uh, we are getting within a factor two of the signature size. There's always this this, this trade off. So if if you really want to go below five um, five kilobytes, then the the signing and computation times explode quite a bit. But there are then yeah. Reason for trade-offs where, where um, computation times are also very low, while you still have a, a rather, rather small signature level. Yeah, so that was that was the 
story about um, rain. I have another table showing you the evolution with, again, with respect to, 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 to the different um, uh, signature sizes, but now on one branch using standard crypto on the other branch using custom crypto. So with the, the first optimizations that happened, uh, a similar approach based on SHA-2 uh, was down to almost, almost a megabyte. Um, with more optimizations, there was a paper um, showing a yes can then be 200 kilobytes. And uh, actually with our proof system that we use in RAIN, we can also uh, give the, the best a yes based signature with around 10 kilobytes in, in size. So this was now a bit of a match with the with, with the custom um, designs where initially it, the, the gap was huge, but then as you can see, um, protocols specialized for yes were, were catching up. Uh, but now with this, uh, within, they came within a factor three of, of low MC around, the, around 2019, but with this new design, um, we have now signatures below below five kilobytes. So yeah, the, the improvements are fairly dramatic. It may still not be enough to immediately put a, a global uh, standard stamp on it. Who knows? But uh, it may well be that there's more uh, improvements to come. And um, yeah, I think this is quite an interesting development. I have here another number for our higher security levels here. The yeah. The smallest signature size are still at uh, around 10 kilobytes. Uh, one more illustration, the signature size versus signing time trade-off. So the, the red dots here, they are from the new signature scheme. And as you can see here, this is the doubly logarithmic way to illustrate it. So it, it looks favorably compared to other, other approaches. Yeah. I will not go into the details. And more beyond that. So last but not least, uh, let me mention one more use case in the area of zero knowledge proofs. Uh, that's the, the, the example I gave at the beginning where we always want to prove knowledge of a pre-image of a hash function. This is again, largely high level, but uh, also based on some very recent uh, work uh, um, yeah, mentioned, mentioned here. So th there's uh, at least two use cases in of hash functions in, in such proof systems. Uh, one is at the level where you, um, at the application, closer to the application level, if you want, where you want to uh, yeah, prove membership of a set, for example, and then there you have Merkle trees and you want to, yeah, in the end, again, prove knowledge of a pre of hash function, and then you need this particular hash function. Uh, also further down the technology stack, if you want, you again have use cases of, of such hash functions. So hashing all over the place. That feels like 2005, right? <laughs> Looking at Gitarra again. So what's, what are the new problems that we are facing here? Uh, this is an attempt to illustrate the situation uh, with numbers that uh, that just give an indication of, of where we are. Uh, this is not a particular unit, these are just indications, but let me walk you through what I mean here. So we care about uh, proving time. This is the zero knowledge time here, but many use cases also care about, uh, let's call it plain performance, the direct implementation of a hash function on a in software on, on a CPU that's called x86 time here. And let's focus on these two. Um, columns for the moment. Um, yeah, in industry, what appears to be a popular choice is uh, Blake 2. That's why we use it here in, the, in this table. Um, it's fairly fast on a, on a, as a plain implementation. That's why there's a one here. It was not designed at all for the zero knowledge use cases. That's why there's a hundred here, meaning it's, 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 it's very slow. Um, so it was mentioned already in the, in the introduction a few years ago, we designed uh, Poseidon, um, an instantiation of the Hades uh, framework for this type of use cases, um, helping us to minimize the zero knowledge time 
uh, quite a lot, but at, at the same time, we didn't care too much about the, the plain implementation process. It was like, yeah, around a factor 100, really slower than, than other uh, earlier hash designs, more classically, if you want. Um, uh, a different line of work around uh, Tomea and uh, Ili Benzason and others, Rescue was a very nice design, achieving very similar uh, zero knowledge uh, properties. Uh, also didn't care too much about the plane performance. Uh, it, it looks ev even worse, actually. Um, what is always a, a popular choice uh, among uh, companies, libraries that, that use this is actually uh, a construction that is, uh, that is relying on, on number theoretic assumptions which is not as competitive as Poseidon or Rescue in the, in the zero knowledge domain and is also quite slow in the plane. But why do people use it? Well, um, this brings me now to the third column here, the crypto analysis. Uh, it has a reduction to, to a number theoretic problem related to, I think it's related to the discrete log. Um, it, this may not be post-quantum secure, but let's assume we don't care about this. Then this is of course uh, highly desirable to, to have something uh, which at least you don't have to open the proceedings of a new FSC and you again find a tax on, on one of those new hash function candidates. And, and that's why I'm putting here a one on the, in the crypto analysis column, um, essentially hinting towards the situation that this is kind of the lowest level of confidence we might, have, we might have. We do, of course, uh, the analysis uh, we can do when we do this designs and then we add some security margin, but still these are designs that work not over the uh, not over the bit strings, but uh, over GFP, over integers. And this is a, a much newer uh, domain that perhaps was only started with our MIMSI design in, in 2016 for this kind of practically efficient um, use cases. And there may well be many more surprises around. Uh, yeah, a plate gets here, a 10 is something in the middle. It's, it's a much more classical design. It receives a number, a lot of crypto analysis already. People don't know how to break it. And then there's a higher, certainly a higher confidence compared to those very recent designs. So at the, at the, at the high level, this opens up this, this big open problem for us, namely to under, better understand algebraic attacks, yeah. attacks that are much more targeted for this kind of uh, approaches that we uh, do in Poseidon and the Indian rescue. And, and this is a long term, a long term goal. I think yeah. it will take a while before we can have a similar level of assurance uh, compared to compared to the designs we did uh, 10, 15 years ago. Um, still, what could we do? Um, to address this, namely to, first of all, be faster than on, on a plane, have a similar performance in the cellular knowledge domain and have uh, faster confidence in, in our designs. Um, so this seems to be a circle that is hard to square. And uh, yeah, what I can show you here is a bit of a, you could call it cheating. It's a bit of a, a, a way to, address this, namely to find a proof system. And this is again, a very recent development that not only um, allows you to have efficient, algebraically simple operations. That's what we have in Poseidon and also in, in Rescue. Um, simple power maps, um, the inverses, that kind of stuff. Um, but there are now new proof systems that allow for a limited number of, of you could call it lookup tables. Um, while still keeping this, this practical efficiency. And by using this property now, combining these two, uh, this, this two uh, approaches, we are able to at least somewhat square this circle here. So what you can see is this concrete proposal of a hash function design where we have at the outer parts, this, this layers concrete and bricks, that's something that roughly resembles what also Poseidon and um, and, and, and rescue are doing algebraically simple um, building blocks operating on, on very large words. So these the bricks here are of size 250, 256 bits, for example. Uh, but 
without anything else, we, we would require same as in Poseidon or as in in um, in in rescue, we would require a huge number of rounds. Um, this can be efficient as you've seen, but then this still opens up the question as if we understand our algebraic attacks more, maybe this turns out to be much less secure than, than, than you think. With this design, we don't rely on the resistance against algebraic attacks of these outer layers at all. Uh, our security arguments against these algebraic attacks are then based on this, this middle layer with this, um, let's call it S boxes that are uh, don't have any uh, mathematical structure. They are essentially random it wrong that they have some, some properties and we, uh, yeah, we have to explain those of course, but uh, the arguments against algebraic attacks are basically uh, concentrated in, in, in this in this core middle round, and essentially then say basically uh, because we cannot break a yes with uh, um, algebraic attacks, it's also likely that we cannot uh, use algebraic attacks to to attack this scheme because we cannot even attack the, the middle party. So at a, at a high level, very hand driven, of course. And then for the other attacks, uh, statistical attacks, rebound attacks, uh, all this kind of stuff, we can rely on. On, on, yeah, on the work that was done 10, 15 years ago um, yeah, by, by many people in our community here. Um, and essentially have done arguments against uh, those uh, parts as well, uh, those attacks as well, without them relying on this, on, on this, new, on this new inner part. Uh, so assuming this, this works out, um, yeah, we have, yeah, let me skip over the details here, but um, we would then have basically uh, this new design, which uh, has a higher confidence without needing to understand algebraic attacks much more beyond what, what we do now. And at the same time, uh, we are now only a factor 10 away from the, the fastest plane hash functions and, and have a similar have a similar proof, have, have a similar proof term. Yeah, so this is uh, a new design here. So let me. Uh, let me move into the last part of my talk here. A few open problems, high level problems. Um, uh, one I mentioned already, can we decrease signature sizes even more for, for these post quantum signature approaches? Um, yeah, can we reduce the computational overhead even more? There's a number of promising directions. Um, simultaneously having good performance in both plain and in zero knowledge domains for hash functions. That's something that is that is really something that the people need and want. And yeah, we have a first uh, proposal in these directions, but uh, I guess there's there's many more ideas to be had there. And then last but not least, um, there's a lot of new designs. Um, there is some supporting cryptanalysis, of course, but um, there's many more uh, yeah, cryptanalysis papers to be to, to be written for sure. Um, so I had new crypto, new, new symmetry crypto in the in the title. So uh, how new are we talking actually? So MIMC was this design where we have the, the, the cube map iterated uh, with a key addition and um, uh, different round constants a number of times. Um, that was from 2016, but it, it turns out that actually um, this idea, even though it, it looked Quite exotic. It was not new. Um, the KN Feistel cipher from '95 by by Nusen and, and uh, Newberg, um, it looked a bit more complicated than this year because it, it had like mappings from 32 to 33 bits and so on. But um, essentially, the idea was the same as in the Feistel variant of of, of our MIMSI. So the, the only claim to have something new, basically along these lines is that remains is essentially the fact that we are not only working with bit strings, but we are also working over FP, over the indices. And, and even though we have now in the last years, a few very nice cryptanalysis papers by, by many of you here on the, on the, on the, on the, on the standard MIMSI construction over the binaries, uh, we know much less um, over, over the primes. Yeah, I will not go much over the S-box size uh, slide here. Uh, the, the message here is that basically things, the trends are going up and down a bit, but uh, with these new designs, we, we suddenly have a, 
nonlinear elements, if, I'm not sure if you want to call it the mass boxes, but anyway, uh, these nonlinear elements, they are suddenly very huge and uh, compared to before. And this again opens up uh, a lot of questions about their, about their uh, analysis. And another point that I would like to mention here is that because we now have nonlinear elements that are so big, we can suddenly again consider the option of having uh, non-invertible, non-invertible uh, building blocks of, of the type. I mean, this was discussed in the '90s a bit, but I think uh, died out. And even recent designs, even Faisal, where, where you don't need uh, invertibility, people still prefer invertible building blocks. Also because you, are, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, local collisions. Uh, but with, with uh, building blocks that huge, 256 bits, um, you may not care too much anymore if, if, if your non-data layer is, is invertible or not. Uh, and this may again give, uh, give uh, rise to new, new design ideas. Another design approach that was uh, used, we had it in, in our conference uh, earlier already, Partial SPNs is something that um, yeah, exists for, for more than 10 years uh, already as well. Um, uh, let me briefly point out um, some open problems there uh, on the partial SPN first. So we had some very a nice paper with first positive results here at this conference. Uh, I think what would be an, a nice open problem in addition to those mentioned in this paper is that uh, to show or or this proof that uh, PSPNs can have advantages in certain settings, probably not only uh, in their, uh, I think it's some in CNCA setting, but also in, in, the, in an indifferentiability setting. That would give a uh, more versatile uh, use for this high level structure uh, because you, you would capture many, many more uh, settings uh, then as well. And another open problem that I keep mentioning is actually uh, it, it may. Uh, be easy in most cases, but what happens to our security proofs in modes when we move from binary strings to 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 FP? Uh, suddenly, plus and minus uh, are not the same anymore, and uh, maybe all is fine anyhow. But it would be good to check, and it could actually be fun to 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 check if you could at least if you don't have any problems, uh, could be fun to to see if you can construct an artificial example of a mode that looks reasonable. But then where security breaks down in one of these two cases, so that that could be fun um, as well. Yeah, I'm wrapping up now. There are a number of um, yeah in bounties uh, challenges around that um, that support crypto analysis for specific uh, cases. There's the the LMC challenge around since since uh, about two years now with a number of winners already. Um, congrats. To all of them on the slides. Um, very recently, in the area of zero knowledge friendly hashes, there's also so much interest that people put out bounties. And I uh, just this ramp session, we had uh, basically seen the results of the, the first winners of this of this challenge here as well. So if you're looking for concrete crypto analysis, I, I can commend you, uh, for example, those two, those two. Um, those two yeah, sites that uh, list a few topics. So let me conclude here with my last two slides. I hope I could show you that um, there are a number of interesting developments in what you could call high function crypto. Um, some of them are likely here to stay. Uh, we will know in, in five years, perhaps, uh, which ones and which ones uh, remain a niche. And this in turn leads to a lot of new interesting problems and venues in the design and analysis of, of, of symmetric crypto. Industry demand is growing for sure. I keep hearing this a lot. Uh, even demands for standards, for example, to support interoperability and in increase trust. So what this means, I guess, is a, even more of a community effort to, to agree on, on what is a good design. And uh, yeah, in order to support this, um, I'm happy to announce that we open sourced many more of our implementations. Uh, this website went live yesterday and for, for free, for all three domains that I, that, that I covered today, uh, the, count, the, the count of publicly available implementations uh, increased sometimes a lot. You know. uh, in the, the case of homomorphic encryption, well, this is out already for half a year or so. Before it was one, now it's actually 16. 
and, and maybe it's a coincidence, maybe not, but now two very recent designs also came with a public implementation against at least one, one library. Here we, we cover several libraries. But yeah, um, I hope this helps to uh, increase the community working on this on this topic. You not only have plain implementations, but also implementations of, of use cases, for example, an end-to-end -end, uh, use case where you prove the knowledge of a pre-image of six different hash functions. If you want to design a new hash function, you can have a look and, and start out with these implementations right away. Yeah, with that, I'm, I'm really at the end of my presentation and uh, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm of course happy to take any questions. Thank you, Christian, for the very nice talk. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we can take a few questions in the room or online. Uh, I have a question. Could you say a few words uh, concerning uh, crypto or related over IoT? Can you say a few words about the choice of keys? Because some people value or find them. Yeah, thanks. Excellent question. Thanks a lot, Anna. Um, Please repeat the question. Oh, yeah. So, Ankantov was asking me to comment a bit more on uh, especially this FP designs, uh, which Piece, can we choose them? Uh, which piece are we working with? Um, so in some use cases, we can freely choose P, but mostly uh, we rely on the underlying crypto system. And for example, in the zero knowledge domain, people work in elliptic curve, uh, work in turn with elliptic curve libraries, and, and then those P's are derived from whatever elliptic curves that, that are around there. So this is a, a very very widespread choice and the uh, yeah I think that's the that's the that's the driving force that's why we have um, hash functions that work over nonlinear building blocks over for example 256 bits because that's exactly matching to an underlying uh, elliptic curve that is used in those libraries um, yeah. uh, hi Christian uh, this is Dima online. So uh, in one of the slides, you are mentioning uh, about this confidence level. You gave one, 10,000. Could you please explain, or, uh, are these kind of studies done for other ciphers as well? Or like this is something you are looking at? Could you explain it a bit further? OK. So I mean, this 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 one in this table here, let me move back. This is perhaps a pretty, pretty harsh statement here. And this is there to, to motivate, basically, um, a new design that does not only rely on algebraically simple building blocks, but also has um, elements that uh, allow for more classical uh, cryptanalysis, if you want. So this numeric value here, this one compared to 100 or so, this is just a, a gut feeling that uh, conveys the idea that for some um, designs that are longer around and more classical, perhaps because they stem from the Shafri competition, have hence more confidence. Uh, this factor 10 in between doesn't have any any real meaning here. So this is this is just my my gut feeling here. And uh, at least in in the short run, this then motivates to combine algebraically simple approaches with something that is more more classical. I hope this could answer your question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Nice talk. Thank you. So if we don't have any more questions, I think it's time to wrap up. So we have a short break. We will start the next uh, session around 10 minutes, I guess. Uh, and please, if you are speaking in the next session, uh, bring your slides. If you have a USB stick, you can put your slides on the computer and this will be much easier.